Well, we've been in the book of Ruth now for a few weeks, and we're in Ruth chapter 4, and I divided Ruth chapter 4 up into two weeks because, I mean, Ruth is so good, let's just extend it, right? It's going to take me two weeks to make it through Ruth 4. Uh, I've been doing a chapter a week up until this point, but we're going to do Ruth chapter 4 this week and next week, Um, and it's the concluding chapter of the book of Ruth, Uh, and if you've been gone the last few weeks, or maybe you've just been sitting in the pews snoring the last few weeks or not paying much attention, let me give you kind of a recap of how we got to where we are today. Way, way back a few weeks ago, we were in Ruth 1, and we learned about a man named Elimelech, and Elimelech um, and his wife and his kids, they moved to a place called Moab. Uh, They moved from the town of Bethlehem to Moab in search of a better life. They were escaping what was going on in Bethlehem, which was a famine that was, as far as we can tell, probably a judgment of God on God's people at the time. And so we find um, two wives, or two wives, two sons, a wife and a dad moving, um, arriving in Moab, living there for a period. But then right away in the first chapter of Ruth, the story takes a quick turn. So they've escaped famine to avoid dying. They moved to Moab where there's food. The city of Bethlehem actually meant the city of bread or town of bread. That's, the, that's what the word Bethlehem means, the place of plenty, the, the town of bread. So they moved from the town of bread where there was no bread to Moab where there was food. And then they die. The men all die. First Elimelech dies and then his two sons die. And so then this leaves Naomi, the mother, and then the wives of the two guys, the wives of the two sons, Ruth and Orpah, it leaves these three ladies in a bind. Well, Naomi hears through the grapevine that there's food back in Bethlehem once again. This is after a number of years that they've been living in Moab. And so she says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move back, move back to Bethlehem. Well, she starts on her way, and the two daughter-in-laws initially start on the truck with her. But after a little bit, Orpah, the one daughter, says, You know what? I love you, Naomi. You're a great lady, you know, but I don't want to go to Bethlehem. I'm, gonna, I, I'm turning around, and I'm heading back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to Moab where I have family, where I have friends, where my gods are, and uh, where I'm comfortable. And so she bids Naomi adieu. And heads back to her people. Ruth, who is also a Moabitess, um, does the opposite, however. And she goes to Naomi and she says, You know what? You are such an incredible woman of character and and, and you have done so right by me. and, And I so respect you that wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I'm going to live. Wherever you die, I will die. Whomever your gods are, they are going to be my gods. And if for whatever reason I break this covenant with you, may your gods strike me dead. That's basically a summary of what she says to Naomi. And so she clings to Naomi and and they continue on this path back to Bethlehem uh, because there is food there. Now the overarching theme of the first chapter of Ruth, as we talked about, is the sovereignty of God. And that is that God is in charge, God is in control, and that God is looking out for these two women, Ruth and Naomi. And that brings us to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we get an important new character to the storyline, a man by the name of Boaz. When they get to Bethlehem, of course, these ladies have nothing. They're broke. And so Ruth goes out into the fields. Um, You see a picture of a wheat field on the screen. Ruth goes out in the fields to glean. And and if you don't know what gleaning was, gleaning was kind of the Old Testament version of the food shelf. Uh, As a landowner, as as a farmer, you were responsible to leave segments of your field Um, where you did not harvest so that the poor, so that the widows could come in and glean and gather their own sheaves of wheat or corn or beans or whatever it was that you had in that field. You had to leave a little bit, right? Well, kind of the going practice in those days was to leave the bare minimum, right? Uh, And that was kind of the going practice. But we'll see in the story that Boaz, this man in the story, is, is abundantly generous. And so Ruth is out gleaning in this field. Boaz is the landowner of this particular field. And he comes in and he he sees this foreign woman he's never seen before out in his field, out working. And he takes a bit of interest in her, right? 
And then we see in, in Ruth 2 how, how Boaz begins to protect her. Um, he, he tells his men, not a one of you are lay a finger on this woman. Right? She is protected. He provides for her. He gives her social standing. He cares for Ruth. Um, and then, and, and towards the end of the ver- or towards the end of the verses in chapter two, he even, in fact, kind of gives her a steady job for the remainder of the harvest season. And, and then he sets her up, kind of like, with a bunch of stuff to take home on top of it. And and he provides just abundantly for her. And this again is as a a reminder from the first chapter of God's sovereignty. And then we hear at the end of that chapter, right at the very end, we find out, oh yeah, and by the way, this Boaz guy, he's actually kind of related to Naomi, right? And that's a good thing. And we get to chapter three where we were last week. We see in the story then, like six to eight weeks had passed when we get to chapter three. The two harvests had taken place. And for whatever reason, Mr. Boaz... He's kind of dropped the ball, right? He kind of showed some interest in Ruth early on, and now he's not calling her all of a sudden, right? And he, it, It's just like six to eight weeks, right, ladies? If, if some guy showed interest and didn't call you for six to eight weeks, you'd be like, I'm done with him, right? And that's kind of what, what was almost going on here. But Boaz is a catch, right? And so Naomi kind of hatches a plan. The mother-in-law, she's, she's sharp. She's a shrewd lady, very smart lady, it seems. And so Naomi hatches this plan, and she tells Ruth, Hey, Ruth, here's what we're going to do. Go get yourself all dolled up, right? Because, see, Ruth, she's been working out in the fields every day, and, and they're poor. So, like, she has one outfit, and she's, like, stinky, dirty, nasty every day when Boaz comes rolling by in his F-350 chariot, right? When she, she's all covered in manure and dirt and dust and bug bites, and he's not seen her at her best. So Naomi goes, Ruth, go get dolled up, right? Go get the mani-pedi. Go get a facial. Go, get your good going to church dress on, right? Put some perfume on and smell nice for once, right? It's kind of what Ruth gets told to do anyhow. You get the idea. And so Naomi then sends Ruth down to Boaz's warehouse where the grain from the harvest was being stored and processed. And Naomi gives Ruth some very specific instructions. She says, they're going to be partying tonight. They're going to be celebrating that the harvest is done. And so wait, pay attention to where he lays down because he's going to stay there and watch over his grain overnight. Wait till he lays down, scope out where he's sleeping when he blows out his lantern or he blows out his lamp. Then what you do after he's laid down and gone to bed for the night, quietly, quietly go in there, right? Now, not, not, nothing bad, nothing weird's happening here, but she says, go in there and just lift the covers off of his feet, right? And then lay down at his feet. And if you're like me, if somebody came and lifted the covers off your feet, that would wake you up, right? You'd be like, what's going on here? My feet are cold. And so that's what she does. And she lays down after she uncovers his feet and waits for instruction from Boaz. Uh, See, because it's been six to eight weeks, Ruth and Naomi decide they're going to force this issue with Boaz. And and Ruth, by doing this, is basically saying to Boaz, hey, hey, mister, I want to kind of be your lady, right? Uh, She's she's pressing the issue and basically saying, what are you going to do about it, Mr. Boaz? Now, Boaz, being a man of honor, a man of character, he steps up to the plate. So the thing he does when his feet get uncovered and he realizes, who's there? Oh, it's Ruth. Oh, yeah, I know who you are. You're the Moabitess who's been working out in my field that i kind of shown some interest in, right? The first thing he does is he says to her, tomorrow morning, first thing, I'm going to head into town and I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to arrange things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in and take care of some business. But he says, here's the problem, Ruth. He says, I want to redeem you, so I want to make you mine. But... By law, I'm not the first guy in line. There's another relative who has, by law, the responsibility to take care of you and Naomi first. And so I've got to go to this guy and and basically get his permission before I can do this. But he says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to town tomorrow, and I will take care of this, right? And so the chapter 3 closes with Ruth and Naomi waiting to hear how things go for Boaz in town. 
So that kind of gets you all caught up to where we are. If you've got a Bible or a Bible app in your phone or your iPad or whatever, feel free to open to Ruth 4. And I'm going to walk my way through these verses. I'll read some of it to you and make some comments along the way. And we'll see how, how far we get. But I know we're not going to finish it this week. But anyhow, starting Ruth 4. If you don't know where Ruth is, Ruth is a tiny little book sandwiched between uh, judges and kings. Okay, So very early, very early in your Bibles. Ruth 4.1 says this. It says, Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate, and he sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said to him, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over, and he sat down. Now, last week, as I said, we saw this bold step of, of Ruth stepping up and revealing the depth of her love and her desire for marriage with Boaz. Uh, she, she makes that move in the threshing room floor. And here we see Boaz is responding in kind to Ruth's advance. Um, but before Boaz, as I said, can take her as his wife, he's got to go take care of business. And according to the laws and customs of this time, this other male relative is in first place. And so he has claim not only to provide for these two women, but he also stands in first place to claim the land that Naomi would potentially own. And her family still had land there in Bethlehem. So there may be an issue here is all that's going on. And verses 1 through 12, as we read through these in, in Ruth 4, they explain to us just how shrewdly you're going to see here, just how, how wise and shrewd Boaz is in dealing with these boundaries that the, the, the laws of that time had set upon him. And so he, he works within the law, and we're going to see in a moment how that goes, to make sure he gets to take Ruth for his wife. So first thing, gets up in the morning, goes down to the town gates where all the business of town tends to be transacted. If you don't know the layout of these towns you know, 2,000 years ago, they were kind of compact little towns. There weren't a lot of open spaces. There weren't a lot of places where people could meet and gather in large number. One of the few places where you could do this was down at the city gate. Um, The city gates tend to be places that had sizable open spaces uh, for people to gather, and that's why these sort of business transactions took place down there. Uh, Many of these cities would have protective walls, as we know, um, protective walls on the outside edges of town, and, and so that really put a premium on land inside of the city. If you had the wealth, if you had the ability, you wanted to be inside of those walls because when enemies would come, you were somewhat protected, right? And so that that really put the premium on that space, and that's why these meetings would take place down there at the gates. And so they get there, they do their legal, they do their social matters, and they take care of the things they need to do. And verse 1 here of chapter 4 finds Boaz at the gates. And lo and behold, who shows up? The guy Boaz needs to deal with if he's going to be redeeming Ruth. And the story never tells us what this other guy's name is, right? So we'll call him Mr. What's-His-Face for simplicity's sake. Um, But demonstrating his commitment to redeeming Ruth, Boaz quickly gathers enough elders around himself to oversee the transaction that's about to take place. He needs some legal witnesses, basically, for this deal that's about to go down. So in verse 2 it says, Boaz took ten of the elders of town and said, Hey guys, after he got the first guy there, he said, Hey guys, the ten of you, come sit here. And so they did. And then he said to Mr. What's-His-Face, the kinsman redeemer, he says, hey, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech, her husband. Verse 4. He says, I I thought that I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these guys that have gathered here. If you want to redeem it, do so. Okay? He's saying, you, you need to take care of this. But if you happen to not want to, right? if you happen to not want the land, if you happen to not want the ladies, just let me know, and I will. right? For no one has the right to do it except for you, and then I am the next one in line. So Boaz says his piece, and then the story takes a twist. What does the man say? The man says, Okay, I'll redeem it. You know, it's like, dun, 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 right? At that point in the movie or TV show. 
Boaz explains that Naomi the widow is in a bad place financially. She needs to sell her family's land to make ends meet, make ends meet and to put food on the table. And, and, and this is a severe situation for these ladies because land at that time meant wealth, right? Land at that time meant you had a future. Land at that time meant you could grow crops. Land at that time meant you could raise animals. If you didn't have land, you were at the mercy of working for somebody else. If you wanted to make it in the world of the time, you needed to own some land. They didn't have 401ks. They didn't have retirement accounts. They didn't have bank accounts for that matter, right? All of your wealth, you put into land. All of your wealth, you put into animals on that land. That's how you stored up wealth on earth at that time. And so the fact that she's got to sell this land really points to just how broke these two ladies were. She's fallen on desperate times. And the land has probably belonged to her family for generation upon generation. So this is a big deal. Because when you sell your land, not only are you selling your future, but you're selling your children's future, your grandchildren's future, your great-grandchildren's future, because it might have taken generations to acquire this land. So this is a big deal in this culture that she has to sell this land. Okay, And so if this land was sold, and it was sold outside of the family, that would be an especially, especially bad thing. So that's why Mr. What's-His-Face gets the first shot. So at least the land will stay in the family, right? And he's the closest relative, so he gets first choice. Boaz has to give him the opportunity to purchase the land by law. So Boaz shrewdly arranges for all of this to come together. He presses the man for a decision, thinking, if you don't want it, I'm going to take it, right? But then the story, the story takes that twist. The man thinks about it for a second and goes, ah, yeah, I'll take it. Huh. Boaz is probably going, you didn't really see that one coming, Right? Not the direction you expect the story to turn, is it? I mean, this means that this other guy is going to be obtaining Ruth. He's going to be taking the responsibilities that come with that and Naomi. And, and he's going to get the land. And that means Boaz can't marry her. We can't have our fairy tale ending. Oh no, Prince Charming. Right? Verse 5. Then Boaz said, on the day you should know that you buy this land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Well, that doesn't mean as much to us, but let me explain that. Rather than simply giving up, Boaz presses on. He hears news, this guy's going to buy the land, that he doesn't want to hear. Bo- Boaz, though, isn't ready to give up, right? He could have given up hearing that, but he doesn't. He presses in. He keeps at it, which is, I think, because of his character. Very respectable man. He was a a man of honor. And he intended to have Ruth as his wife. So Boaz takes these negotiations and turns them into his favor, right? Here's what he does. Boaz reveals, there's some other details, buddy, that you need to know about this transaction. He says, kind of like, behind door number two, you not only get to purchase this land, but you also get to assume the responsibility for these two ladies. This bitter, angry old mother-in-law. Remember, Naomi changed her name to Mara, right? Mara means bitter. So you get grumpy old granny, (laughs) right? And Ruth. Okay, so the guy's thinking about this, right? Well, I get grumpy old granny, I get Ruth. And Ruth, oh yeah, she's a Moabitess. She's from that country where they're like, they're sexual perverts, they have false gods. We're not, oh, those are bad, Moabite? Oh, I don't want a Moabite woman. And not only that, if you take Ruth, she has no children. And he doesn't say this here, but this is part of the plan. This is part of the thing. She has to have children to someday take care of her while you, when you die. So you're going to have to you know, bring her some sons, right? That's part of the deal. You're taking Elimelech's family in with it, 
then you've got to make sure that you give her sons so that this land that you are purchasing from Naomi will pass on to her family for generations. So now at this point, Mr. What's-His face is going, well, I thought the land was a good deal, right? But when Boaz says, not only do you get the land, but you get grumpy granny and you get the Moabite's wife, I, I can just kind of hear, you know, like in his brain, the, hitting the brakes, right? Hold on a second. Wait a minute. What'd you say about that? Uh, this is starting to sound like not such a good deal. I mean, I already have one mother-in-law. That's enough. <laughs> right? If I bring another woman home, I don't think any of us are going to live. My wife will kill me. Right? Can you imagine this guy sitting at the gates, all of a sudden realizing, huh, there's more to the story. He's like, I brought home a new chariot last year and I didn't ask my wife if I bring home a woman. Oh my goodness. And not only that, but if he takes Ruth in and they have children, her children are going to be able to inherit his wealth. So his kids are going to lose out on a portion of what they would have inherited. So all of a sudden he's going, wow, I thought this was a good deal, but now that you mention that, this kind of looks like trouble. Verse 6. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, Oh, then I, I cannot redeem it because it might endanger my own estate. Boaz, why don't you redeem it yourself, right? I can't do it. Verse 7. Now earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing the transaction in Israel. So it says there then that the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And so he reaches down, rips off a shoe. Here's your sandal, right? Now it's just a public way. Everybody seeing this would know a deal had just gone down, right? So Mr. What's-His-Face steps aside and chooses not to redeem Ruth, chooses not to buy Naomi's land, and in doing so, permits Boaz to step up to the front of the line. Boaz is now in first position as redeemer. And then in verse 9, it says, Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech and Kilian and Malon. Verse 10, And I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are my witnesses. Boaz immediately takes action. Kind of like a, 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 a robin pouncing on a worm, right? Boaz inks the deal while there's witnesses there. He, he takes the man's sandal and, and, and agrees upon this arrangement. Uh, the sandal passing is like a, a, a notary stamp, right? The, the deal is done. It's legally binding. It's a transaction. So in the story now, Boaz stands in stark contrast to Elimelech. Elimelech, the original father in the story, married to Naomi. Boaz is now a blessing to these women. We see Boaz as a, a man of strong faith, a man of wise and shrewd action. The flip side of that was Elimelech, a man of foolish action, a man who led his family astray, causing them great pain and, fi and, and, and finally enormous tragedy into their lives. In verse 10, Boaz announces his intention to present Ruth as his wife and that he intends to honor the requirements that go with that, to provide offspring, to carry on Elimelech's name, right? Boaz's character throughout the story shines forth, and, and he's been a blessing to everyone throughout the story, again and again. He's been a blessing since he showed up in chapter 2. He's blessed Ruth, he's blessed Naomi all along the way, with food, with jobs, with take-home food, with extra food that they could sell so they would have some extra money. He just keeps on blessing them. And now he's blessing even Naomi's deceased husband by making sure his name can carry on. All of this at great expense to Boaz. This wouldn't have come cheap. And he has taken it upon himself to care for these women and this family. <clears throat> Verse 11. Then the elders... And all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord 
make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Epaphratha, which is the old name for Bethlehem, and be famous throughout Bethlehem. And then it says in, in verse 12, through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez who Tamar bore to Judah. The people, the people witnessing this this day, seeing this legal transaction go down, respond to Boaz's commitment to Ruth and Naomi by asking for God's blessing upon Ruth. Blessing upon Boaz. That they would be fruitful and multiply and have children and that God would provide in amazing ways. And, and, and these people who are watching, they understand God's providence that he is working through this story, that he is in control of the situation, that God has indeed been watching over them and watching out for them. And in praying that, that Ruth would be like Rachel and Leah we see that they no longer consider her an outsider in any form or fashion. They would not have said, may you be like Rachel, if they thought she was going to continue on being a Moabitess. Because again, Moabites, they were bad people. You you didn't do business with them. You didn't hang out with them. You didn't talk to them. You didn't visit them. You had nothing to do with them if you were a Jew. And so they have thrown their arms open and accepted her in fully, given her standing beyond the standing that Boaz had already given her. And they call for Boaz uh, to be made famous, right? Well, here we are like 3,000 years later. Anybody think Boaz is still famous? We're still talking about the guy, right? Yeah. And in praying that Boaz's family be like that of Perez, they are praying that his family line would endure for many, many generations to come. The town of Bethlehem itself finds its roots in the family of Perez. So we see in this chapter Boaz as this man of action, right? This man with character, a strong character. He's bold, he's wise, he's shrewd in his business dealings. He's a a man who keeps his promises. He's a man who works hard towards his goals. Boaz leaves a great legacy, a legacy far greater than any I'm sure he could have imagined. Boaz is a redeemer. He redeems Ruth. And that is why I said early on why we wanted to study this as we head towards Easter. Because this whole story is about redemption, about a redeemer, an Old Testament redeemer, but a redeemer nonetheless. And as we get to the New Testament times, we too have a redeemer, don't we? His name is Jesus, right? And just as Boaz was willing to redeem Ruth, so too has Jesus chosen to redeem us because of his great love for us. And just as Boaz was willing to pay whatever the price was to redeem Ruth, so too has Jesus been willing to pay whatever the price was for us all the way to his own blood on the cross to redeem us. Just as Boaz did all of the work to redeem Ruth. So too has Jesus done all of the work to redeem us. As Boaz loved Ruth and took her for his bride, so does Jesus love us, the bride, his church. And just as Boaz redeemed Ruth in the land, Jesus is continually redeeming his people, redeeming us, redeeming all of creation for that matter. And if you know your biblical history, you know that through the line of Boaz will one day come who? Jesus, who is our glorious Boaz, according to the great theological preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Jesus is our Boaz, our Redeemer. So this week, I challenge you to take this redemption theme to heart. Take it to heart as you leave today. Don't don't let this opportunity slide past you to reflect on the glory and the splendor and the greatness of the work and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And how through that sacrifice, he's offered to each and every one of us 
this very thing of redemption, this very thing of forgiveness of our sins, this very thing of entering into eternal communion with him. Just as Ruth, we have a Redeemer. Dwell on that this week and how beautiful and how glorious it is. Let's pray.